In our opening passage from Job, we saw that Elihu was a type of the Holy Spirit, talking about Job and how God would justify Job. The question is, will you allow God to be your justification and defense? Will you allow Jesus to be your light? He is the light of the world, but is he light for you and for me? Is he the one that, as Elihu said to Job, that is justifying you, is defending you? Or do you have to justify and defend yourself? I guarantee you, if you have to justify and defend yourself, you will wear yourself out. You will lose your strength. You lose your relationship even with God. Does God understand what our lives are like sometimes? This is what Elihu is asking when he says, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. I don't think any of us who are at least or beyond the age of childhood haven't seen that pit that life can be. Because we all have been in darkness at one time or the other. As Brother said, all you have to do is go out into the city and you see how much darkness is surrounding us. But the reality is a lot of times that darkness is within us as well. Because we have a fallen human nature. And we have to fight even against ourselves. And this is really enemy number one right here. The greatest darkness we have to deal with is right inside here. And God knows that very well. Thank and praise his worthy name that he knows that very well. You know, of all the men that have ever lived besides Christ, Job was the one that had to give up the most. He lost everything, even his health. But he still ended up doing what? Cursing God? Mistrusting God? Oh, he knew what it was like to face that great darkness. And he said he lamented even the day that he had been born. He was suffering so much. I don't think any of us have suffered that much yet. Any, not any of us have had to give up that much for the Lord. In fact, I don't think, really, we hardly know what suffering is like in comparison to that. I mean, look at, look at life in the 21st century. You lose your job, you get unemployment. You don't have enough money to give you welfare. You know, we have plenty to eat, plenty to drink. Everything is just fine. Materially. But spiritually, it's probably the worst time that there ever was. Because we're surrounded by, like Brother said, so many young people that are destroying themselves. That are going down the pit into destruction. And oh, Satan makes it look like they're having such a great time. It looks like they're having a great time. Destroying themselves. Is that darkness? It's horrible darkness. And for those that will live their lives by the honor and glory of God, by the light of God, we have to face these situations. We have to face the reality of the way that life is. And we have, to, we have to deal with these sorts of people, these sorts of situations all the time. As is the pen of inspiration tells us, the world has already seen, in a time of intellectual darkness, spiritual darkness. But the time is coming when the world will see, in a time of great intellectual light, Spiritual darkness. Are we coming to that time? Yes. I think we're actually in that time already. Because all of this 
intellectual light, oh, it's there in the internet. You know, you can, you can look up any little tiny bit of information. It's there. Intellectual light everywhere. But in that same internet, spiritual darkness and horror and, and every ugly and perverse thing. You can find it there as well. In fact, it's much more prevalent than the intellectual light. So what do you and I have to do today? Because we know that the hard times are coming. Sister Angela, do you know that hard times are coming? I think it's the time of trouble. The hard times are coming. Absolutely. The hard times are coming. So what will we do when the hard times come? Only you and I can answer that for ourselves. I can't answer for you. You can't answer for me. Are we preparing for the time when gross darkness will cover the land and the people? Well, it's already been read this morning, John chapter 1, verse 4, but let's read John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. Maybe you can read that for us, Sister Angela, if you'd be so kind. John chapter 8, verse 12. Verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen. What did he promise uh, us if we would receive his light? Did you catch it? Yeah, no, that didn't give us nothing. We're not going to walk in darkness. We can't walk in darkness. But we're faced with darkness, aren't we? Yeah. That darkness from the outside is always threatening to penetrate inside, isn't it? And the light has to resist the darkness, has to dispel the darkness. It cannot be allowed to actually penetrate inside of us. But we have to acknowledge that we have darkness inside. Do you and I tend to dwell upon the negative in our experiences? I know I do. Do you and I tend to listen to the negative clamorings of our own natures? I know I do. And it's a competition to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit or to listen to the negative clamorings of my own thoughts. And if I don't pray, and if I don't read the Bible, and if I don't share the faith with other people, the negativity, the darkness will overcome me. Sometimes I have to even ignore what family members are saying in order to see what God is saying. Because those family members whether they know it or not, will be trying to drag me down. And they can't help it. They're just as much trying to fight against the negative in the darkness as I am. You know, Ellen G. White said, sometimes even her own husband was being used of Satan to drag her down. And she had to, she had to even tone his words out so she could listen to what God was saying. It's true. It's true. Jesus was the light of his people. He was the light of the world. But, but if the darkness was so much surrounding him in that time, how could he be the light of the world? How many nights did he spend completely in prayer? How many days did he spend completely giving and sharing light with other people? And from him has come every ray of heaven's brightness that has ever lighted this world. 
In the plan of redemption, Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He better be the foundation and the center of every doctrine that we have, or else it will be proven by someone down the track that we shouldn't have that message to them, that doctrine, whatever it is. It might be something very basic, like the sanctuary, or it might be something as, as such as a fine point as dress reform or health reform or the understanding of prophecy or the 144,000. But if Christ is in the center of it, if he is in the foundation of that light, in that doctrine, somebody is going to prove, probably falsely, that it's darkness. They will war against it, and they say, well, but Christ is in the center of that doctrine, and they will be right if you and I don't make Christ the center of that doctrine. It's going to be proven falsely, but it will be proven that it's of the darkness. Only if we know Jesus as a source of happiness and peace and truth in our lives will we be able to even overcome the negative clamorings of our own fallen human nature. Psalm 36, verse 9. Psalm 36, verse 9. Who would like to stand and read it? If anybody is threatening to fall asleep on me, well, you know who you are, so you might as well go ahead and stand and read it now. So I don't have to, I don't have to call it. 36, 9? Yes, please. Yes. Psalm 36, verse 9. Porque contigo está el manantial de la vida. En tu luz veremos la luz. For with thee is the fountain of light. In thee we shall see light. Isn't that a beautiful promise? Yes. You know, scientists tell us that... Light, you, you see a ray of light from, from the sun, and you think, oh, that's just one beam, right? And it is a beam. But if you look at that under a microscope, or a spectroscope, actually, it would have to be, you will see tiny photons of light, millions and billions of them. That's what light is actually made up of. Many, many photons just streaming and streaming. And it, they swirl around, and sometimes in a beam they go in one direction, but just like if, if uh, you had a, uh, a film camera and you would want to change the film or take the, the film out of that camera, you would have to keep all the light away from it or else the, the light would expose that film, right? So you'd have to actually put your hands inside like a, a, a bag that would be sealed and, and do it all in the dark by feel. You know why? Because those photons of light from all around the room are swirling around and they will actually penetrate into the darkness unless you're very careful to keep that seal where the film is. And the Apostle Peter sort of talked about this concept when he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, this is the way that we should be in the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Who would like to read that for us? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Verse 5? Yes. Ye also, as lively stones, are built of a spiritual house, and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Yes, we're all little stones. He didn't think that he was the, the, the big stone. He realized that he was just a little stone too. That's what the medium was named, Petros. Little stone. And so we're all supposed to be little stones, little beacons of light. Little photons of light to make up a house of light. Is your house, is your marriage, is your home, your family a beacon of light in your neighborhood? It should be. It has to be. If not, the darkness is going to overwhelm 
your home, your family, your marriage, and you're going to end up being swept away in darkness. We have to fight against the darkness. Amen. Or the darkness will win. And you know what the best thing is? The best defense is a good offense. If you're in the middle of great darkness, you've got to dispel the darkness. And how do you dispel the darkness? Not with more darkness. You have to bring the light. And the light will dispel the darkness. That's the only way. That's the only way that the darkness flees. To let the light shine. And our homes, our families, our marriages have to be beacons of light in our neighborhoods. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. Proverbs 6. Who would like to read this for us? Proverbs 6, verse 23. Nicole, you do such a good job reading. Why don't you read it for us? Proverbs 6, verse 23. Commandments is a lamp and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Is Jesus the light of life for you and I? He is. And if He is, His commandments. Will they be a lamp? Will his law be a light? Absolutely. It has to be. They have to be. Or are we trusting in our position? Trusting in our wealth? Trusting in our power? Trusting in anything else? If you are trusting in anything else, God will allow that thing to fail you. That person to fail you so that he can be your light. We have to remember that this is not our home. This is only the way of darkness. In this world, he has to give us a desire for heaven, okay. an understanding for this world as a place of darkness, not a place of light, not a place of joy, not a place of peace even. And so, these things have to fail us, so we don't live for these things anymore. Just like Elihu said, to bring back Job's soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of God. Or he could try to bring his own light, walk in the sparks of his own kindling, justify himself, Elihu gave him the choice, didn't he? Let God be your defense, or you can defend yourself. Or the psalmist who said, for thee is the fountain of light, with thee is the fountain of light, in thy light shall we see light. If we are truly allowing him to be our light, then we must reflect that light to others. You know, I read in the pen of inspiration, no one is going to be saved without what? Help me out. Without? You have to receive the light. And no one is going to be saved without sharing the light with others. Without missionary work, we can't be saved. You know, it's a blessed privilege to be full-time in missionary work. Sure, there's problems in missionary work. You know, you have people problems, you get sniped at, you, you get up on a pedestal so people, you know, have something to attack. But, even so, it's a privilege to go through all of that. It's a privilege to work with human souls, to lead them to the foot of the cross, to be a light to them. Because in this way, we actually work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, don't we? Every one of us is called a mom to be a missionary, though. Some of us have got the privilege to be a full-time missionary. Especially those inside the church need to see light from us. Those little children, they need to see in us 
compassion, love, understanding. Sister White would often say, parents, love your children. It's almost never actually reflected in her writings, but I understand from those eyewitnesses of her sermons. They, they gave this testimony. Parents, love your children. That's what she would say at the end. Parents, be a light to your children. Parents, parents, show them compassion, show them love. And every older person in the congregation needs to do that. Because it takes all of us to raise children. You know, praise God for this, this precious family that has dedicated a child. But all of us should actually be helping raise little Ian Lucas. Uh -huh. How was it with Moses, remember? There was a time when he was reflecting light to Israel. Remember? What happened? What happened when he was reflecting light? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And there are verse 7 to 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. Who'd like to read that for us? Would you like to read a verse, Nicole? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. How about if you read verse, let's give you a nice, easy one, verse 8. And somebody can read verse 7. You can read, you can read verse 8, okay, Nicole? Okay, Nicole. Como no se da más bien con gloria el ministerio del Espíritu. Good, yes. Okay, now somebody else read the other verses for us, please. 7 to 11. 7 to 11? Yes. Y si el ministerio de muerte grabado con letras en piedra fue con gloria, Tanto que los hijos de Israel no pudieron fijar la vista en el rostro de Moisés a causa de la gloria de su rostro, la cual había de perecer. ¿Cómo no será más, cómo no será más bien con gloria el ministerio del Espíritu? Porque si el ministerio de condenación fue con gloria, mucho más abundará en gloria el ministerio de justificación. Hasta once. Hasta once. Porque aún... Lo que fue glorioso no es glorioso. En este respecto, en comparación con la gloria más eminente. Porque si lo que, lo que perece tuvo gloria, mucho más glorioso será lo que permanece. Thank you. So what was to be abolished here? So many of our Christian friends will try to tell you the law was abolished. But what was actually passing away? It's, it's, I think it's, in some ways it's more clear in the New King James. They could not steadily look at the face of, Je of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory, what? Passed away. Yes. After a week or two, the glory was gone. That light was no longer there in his face so that they could look at him again. That glory went away. And as the Apostle Paul says, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? There was great glory in the Old Covenant. That was reflected through the face of Moses. But that glory went away. Tell me, is the glory of Christ ever going to go away? Is His light ever going to go away? Never. That Old Covenant was only glorious because it reflected the glory of the coming Messiah. That was the only way it was glorious. Just like the woman. Remember the woman in Revelation 12? Where's the moon? Where's the moon for the woman in Revelation 12? At her feet. At her feet. Because she was the New Testament church. And at her feet was the reflected glory. Because that's all that the moon does. It only reflects light. It doesn't have any light itself. But she was clothed with the sun. sun. So the sun gave the light. 
And she was clothed with that light. The sun, S-O-N, gave her the light. Not just the S-U-N. That type of sun. You and I must reflect the light. Just like Moses, he was so close to God, his face reflected that light, didn't it? Didn't it? What was the time that Jesus came into? You know, that time that he was, that, that, that he came, it was such great darkness that people would have perished. If he wouldn't have come at that time, they would have perished in the darkness. They would have all been gone. And I guess the whole human race. But he came and shone the light on all of that <coughs> oppression and corruption and perversion that was life on planet Earth at that time. Under the Roman occupation, that's how it was. Is there a, a cure for guilt and depression? What do you think? Is there a cure for guilt and depression? Matthew 18, verse 12 and 13. And I'm just going to sum up a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy and then we're going to close. Matthew 18, verse 12 and 13. Who would like to read that for us? Matthew 18, verse 12 and 13. How think you, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them is gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and go into the mountains, and seek at that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine, which went not away. Thank you. Sister White writes here that when we dwell upon darkness and act like orphans, when we're so depressed and so discouraged, it certainly doesn't honor God. And she says, she appeals time and time again, how can we dwell on darkness? How can we... we uh, act like orphans? How can we take our eyes off of the light? How can we be so discouraged? But maybe we should acknowledge that she in her life spent weeks, sometimes weeks, weeping because she was dealing with so many human reactions from her own brethren to her and her husband's ministry. She knew what it was like to be discouraged, to be depressed, to be disappointed. But she appeals here an upward look around page 150. Don't be that way. Don't dwell upon the darkness. Allow the light to shine. Come back to the light. Sure, if you've been disappointed, if you've been discouraged, that's nothing new. Jesus was disappointed. He wasn't discouraged. Even upon the cross, he was still of good, of good cheer. And may the Lord help you and I to be of good cheer as well. That we do not dishonor God, but that we will walk in the light of His goodness and His mercy and His life. Amen. Amen. Amen.